come back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Palato of MediaMonarchy.com. Beat the Southern Poverty Law Center. We got that story plus the Ministry of Truth being set up in California. But first, police chief calls press conference and arrests everybody who shows up. Over the weekend, the police chief for the Leon Valley Police Department in Texas called a late afternoon press conference to talk about all these police accountability activists that have been live streaming their friendly neighborhood officers. However, as soon as the conference began, Chief Joseph Salvaggio began arresting people and then detained the entire crowd. Now, the backstory to this, the setup, over the past two months, Salvaggio has been the subject of multiple videos and independent media articles for his alleged corruption. According to the group National Association for Individual Rights, controversy began the day after May Day, May 2nd, when Jesus Padilla was arrested while filming outside Leon Valley City Hall. It continued into last week, and as the Free Thought Project reported, where we get this article from, multiple people were arrested for their freedom of speech last week as they desecrated a thin blue line American flag, which seemed to be coming quite popular. As the conference began, Salvaggio announced the immediate arrest of one of the activists. First and foremost, said Salvaggio as he walked out of City Hall and approached the crowd that gathered, Bow, come over here, you're under arrest. After arresting Bao Nguyen, Salvaggio began to address the rest of the media, many of whom were legit credentialed reporters. I totally, totally support your right to put something online, your First Amendment right, said Salvaggio before completely negating that statement. Everybody else, you are not free to leave. You are witnesses. Every one of y'all, witnesses to a crime. Every one of your cameras, your devices, every one of them, they're going to be taken. Every one of y'all, sit down right here. Salvaggio then ordered his officers to arrest every single other person in attendance, including those who tried to walk away. During the press conference, Salvaggio said the arrests were due to comments left on these live streamers' YouTube channels that threaten police officers, as to imply it's their fault people make threats on their channels. Interestingly enough, James, just an hour or so ago, Rika, the hopeful voluntarist, posted the link in the Media Monarchy chat to Bao Nguyen's live stream. His channel, I guess, is called Clash with Bao, and I believe she knows him. They're all over there in Texas, and there was some pretty hefty live stream action going on as I just watched it a little bit ago, so we'll include that in the show notes and the links. But I think if we kind of tie this into the rage purge culture that we've been talking about, James, I keep thinking about that story from a couple of weeks ago about all the Congress critters needing this protection. And we now see kind of breaking out on the streets of America what they're calling the loss of civility, all these public confrontations and shamings. It's getting kind of heated as summer starts to heat up. James, what do you see? Well, I see essentially the, uh, the I think the power mad narcissistic uh, psychopaths at the very top like to have power mad narcissistic psychopaths underneath them to be the enforcer class, but they don't like it when the, those people get out of line in a way that brings draws attention to the process. So I do not believe that these arrests are going to stand. Uh, I mean, obviously there is no law about <laughs> someone said something on a YouTube chat stream, therefore I'm arresting you. It makes absolutely no sense. This will not stand in court. Of course, there's always ways they can apply some silly law in some way that doesn't that's completely out of context to you know put you in jail if they really want to unless uh, there's enough ire and public reaction that uh, that becomes unviable and I think that would be the case uh, here so I'm not expecting that this will proceed um, uh, very far in terms of actually arrest uh, keeping these people in jail but having said that I mean this brings up a number of issues including of course the contentious relationship between the police and the press. And what does the press even mean? The credentialed reporters. That means technically, legally, nothing. Uh, there's no difference between you and a credentialed reporter in the eyes of the law uh, for the purposes of the First Amendment, nor should there be. We do not want the government deciding who is and, is and is not a legitimate reporter because we know what direction that will go in. More and more on that in a minute. But, uh, yes, uh, for people who are interested in this whole topic of, well, when is it okay to film the police or to film these types of things and what can we do? I would suggest going way back in the Corbett Report archives to an interview that I did six years ago now with Carlos Miller of Photography is Not a Crime, talking about his 
travels and travails in, I believe, in Florida, where he uh, had many run-ins with the police trying to tell him that he could not film this or that when he clearly could, and he challenged and won in court numerous times uh, for the crime of trying to photograph the police. Um, it is not a crime in most jurisdictions, in most senses. So, uh, but like anything else, if they... Uh, if you don't fight back against this kind of nonsense, they'll just continue pushing. Um, they'll take as much as they can out of uh, public liberties because, hey, no one's pushing back against it. So it is, uh, it is important that we keep the pressure up on this. And as I say, I don't think these uh, current arrests are going to stand. I don't think once it sees a day in court, I don't think this is going to go any further. Isn't it interesting when the sort of when the police state, when it kind of gets so sloppy it's like, whoa, 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 you're kind of you're kind of showing our hand there. You're making it all a little too obvious. So, James, we are pretty much rolling right into a full moon. It's a big kind of extended holiday weekend here in the States, as it's going to be Independence Day next week, and it falls kind of right in the middle. So I know a lot of folks are kind of taking time either on one end or the other. So there's going to be a lot of people kind of out and about and sort of heated it seems like i had somebody asking me just a little bit ago like do, do people seem crazier than, than usual now people seem a little unglued james this is neural next week episode 345 and again to sort of go against everything you were saying that this will never stand this will never happen they can't pass these laws but but wait there's always california california considering creating advisory group for of course fake news with a new Orwellian bill in an Orwellian move straight out of 1984. And a side note, George Orwell would have been 115 this week, by the way. California's proposed a bill to consider creating a fake news advisory group in order to monitor information posted and spread on social media. Senate Bill 1424 would require the California Attorney General to create an advisory committee by April Fool's Day 2019. Further, the council would need to consist of at least one person from the Department of Justice, representatives from social media providers, civil liberties advocates, and First Amendment scholars. The advisory group would be required to study how false information is spread online and come up with a plan for social media platforms to fix the problem. The attorney general would need to present that plan to the legislature by December 31st, 2019. The group would also need to come up with criteria establishing what is fake news and what's just biased information. The EFF, of course, opposes the bill, calling it flawed and misguided. But this is hardly isolated. We see these things in kind of coordinated moves. Of course, the most favored nation, David Rockefeller's favorite joint. In November 2015, the Chinese Communist Party revised its law to impose sentences of up to seven years in prison for spreading rumors about disasters. Meanwhile, of course, in everyone's hated Russia, the Russia Telecom regulator is preparing a draft decree designed purely and simply to block all content that contains false information. We will include, of course, the links to Senate Bill 1424 Internet Social Media Advisory Group. I think they might need maybe like a catchier acronym kind of name. Hopefully, probably this won't pass. It seems kind of a bridge too far. But as we often note on these shows, what about the next time? What about the time after that? The full article from Activist Post goes through the kind of Frankenstein's monster this thing already is. Parts of other terrible bills have bobbed and weaved their way through the California Congress to kind of become this new monstrosity. James? Yes, and we will include a link to the actual Senate bill itself. So please do go and read it and see this, the, this, the text they've struck out. What they took out was the bone-chilling, the even more bone-chilling part of this. The bill would also require the Attorney General to draft potential legislation for mitigating the spread of false information through social media. Legislation for mitigating the spread of false information through social media. What does that mean? Well, thankfully, we'll never find out because that text has been struck from the bill uh, until the next time they try to pass it, as you say, exactly the point. And as you know, and as I know, and as I'm sure most of the audience knows, but let's spell it out here, this is a dagger aimed at the heart of the New World Next Week and the Corbett Report and Media Monarchy and all of the other alternative media that you know and love because this is, I mean, Orwellian is the word and I despair of the fact that the 1984 Orwell Big Brother references have been used to death over the past decade or two, but this, this is the heart 
of the nightmare of the 1984 society is that the government gets to decide what is true, what is officially true history. This is what you can say. This is what you cannot say. And eventually it becomes, this is what you cannot even think. And again, this was not some political satire. This is becoming reality. This is actually happening, and it is steps like this, which, as you say, it's the war of attrition. Maybe this bill won't make it, maybe the next bill won't make it, but the 37th bill down the line might make it in some form, and that's, that's what we have to worry about. This is the ongoing process, and when, if we give an inch in this process, they will take a thousand miles, which is why we cannot allow uh, allow the government to start dictating what is and is not truth. And can you imagine the kinds of panels that they would set up to try to legislate or, or to, to come to a decision? What, oh, this constitutes fake news. This isn't fake news. This is, this is absolute nightmare stuff. So, uh, you know, good luck to the people of California. And, uh, but don't worry, it's coming to the rest of uh, the states very soon, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as California goes, so goes the nation. They sort of set the set the vibe. And again, this is all kind of predicated on the freak out of of you know the post Trump world of things that have already been kind of going on. And again, as they always say, the real action is in the reaction. So maybe this bill won't pass because maybe there isn't the public outcry to make them force and pass this kind of bill, which we know happens when certain kind of events happen, whether real or provocateur. So our final story this week on New World Next Week is a little bit of good news. Finally, sidebar, I hope to have the return episode of Good News Next Week coming very soon. But this right here is more of the maybe not unmitigated variety. Southern Poverty Law Center pays $3.4 million to resolve defamation case. We get this from the very heady law.com. James, I had to kind of chop this down. So I was like, I, I don't understand some of these legalese terms. But it will be included in the show notes. A well-known civil rights group agreed to apologize also in addition to the $3.4 million for a report that listed a Muslim activist as an anti-Islamic extremist. The Southern Poverty Law Center, the advocacy organization known for exposing hate groups and fighting for civil rights, has agreed to pay 3.3 something, 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 something and issue public apologies to an activist who challenged his inclusion in a 2016 SPLC publication that labeled him and several other people as anti-Muslim extremists. So... Now that this has happened, I think essentially there's there's blood in the water for for better or worse. We take it from PJ Media and James. I kind of talked about this story earlier this week on my morning show, but I hadn't actually covered the sort of inciting incident, as it were. I I covered this sort of the effect. No fewer than 60 organizations that have been branded hate groups or otherwise attacked by the Southern Poverty Law Center are considering legal action against the left wing smear factory. A Christian legal nonprofit leader confirmed to PJ Media, which is where we're getting this story from. He suggested that the three mil settlement and apology the SPLC gave to Majid Nawaz and his Quilliam Foundation would encourage further legal action. We haven't filed anything against the SPLC, but I think a number of organizations have been considering filing lawsuits because they've been doing to a lot of organizations exactly what they did to Majid. James, we, of course, will include the links. I'm surprised it goes all the way back, actually, to 2010, your episode, Meet the Southern Poverty Law Center. So now do you think, I mean, in lots of different ways, we see once the the build reaches a tipping point that things are kind of unstoppable. And if there's so much blood in the water and if there are this many lawsuits, they could actually go down. I've also heard discussions of all there, of course, possible offshore accounts and things that they'll yeah. keep all cranking the hate. Yeah, that's the point. They have uh, much, much more money than you would expect for such a uh, humble little organization, just providing legal aid to those in need, right? What? No, this is not at all what the SPLC is about. It is a racket. And for people who don't know about it, not only will I direct them to the Meet the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, episode of my podcast that I did several years ago, but also the uh, the article I did for the International Forecaster last year, Hate is a Racket, SPLC Caught Funneling Millions Overseas. So you're exactly right about that. Yeah, I'm not sure this uh, a few million here or a few million there is necessarily going to sink them, but it may be the reputational 
cost um, and sort of the cost of doing their business, as it were, which is essentially to libel people. I mean, that's that is what the SPLC does. So if they start getting caught in the legal games around that, that could be a problem. And, you know, it's a problem when The Washington Post runs an op ed under the headline, the Southern Poverty Law Center has lost all credibility. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> that's a pretty uh, big step. So, yeah, things are unraveling pretty quickly for the SPLC. And uh, the only thing I can say is what took so long, because as I say, this is their modus operandi. This is what they do. They just label anyone who has a different political opinion than, of, as them as extremists. And so, of course, yes, that is libel. That is reputational damage. And uh, it's just insanity that they've been doing it for as long as they have. And I've been hearing for years about various people. I mean, Luke Rogowski and We Are Change and all of these types of organizations and groups and people that you know in the alt media have been put in their extremist hate map, you know, whatever. This is the, the hate groups we have to watch out for type of list. And I've heard talk about, oh, we should sue them, we should sue them. But, well, someone finally has gone through with that and has won. And uh, hopefully this is just the start of a very long, slow, painful process for the SPLC. Not in the not in the literal physical pain sense, of course, but I mean the financial pain that uh, that is some sort of restitution for the pain that they've caused all the people that they have falsely labeled as extremists. So uh, the tides are turning, and uh, yes, I would say this is this is on the good news side of the ledger. Well, and it just actually kind of struck me as as we were talking about it right here. It took someone to finally actually sue them. Churches and religious organizations generally have a good chunk of change, so I would not be surprised if we see actually a lot of these organizations. Again, it'll be kind of that revenge. The uh, you know what's the dish served cold, James? What well what if they you know their name will get tarnished? They'll just maybe just move it around and change the name, and they'll be absorbed into some other thing, as is quite the style. James, I broadcast news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Hope people come check it out. Well, I'm looking forward to the revivification of the good news next week. I think we can all use a little bit of that. So I'll stay tuned to the Media Monarchy feeds uh, to make sure that I get it when it drops. I hope everyone else will do the same. Until then, James, talk to you next week. All right, buddy. Take care.